Okay, great. Yeah. Well, welcome to today's webinar on how we can all use our financial assets to make a positive impact on the way that we respond to climate change. Coda SA is thrilled that uh, you've joined us today. My name's Miranda Starkey. I'm the Acting Chief Executive here at Coda SA, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce this webinar today. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, we're meeting here. I'm on the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects and Coda SA's respects to Aboriginal elders, past, present and emerging. Kota SA is an older people's movement and we're the peak body representing almost 700,000 South Australians aged 50 and over. Um, we know that South Australians and, and older people really care about the environment and about the impact that they and their families and future generations have on climate change. We are really, really proud that we have a climate change um, action group here at Cota SA. It's a group that feeds into our policy council and uh, informs the work that we do in policy advocacy and engagement. And it's the group that's organising this webinar today. Um, one of the issues that uh, our climate change group is really focused on is, is how we can all take practical action to actually make a difference. Uh, it's, an, it's one thing to care deeply about an issue, it's another thing to take action and that's what today's webinar is about. And I think we all know, um, you know some of the things we can do as energy users and as consumers to make a positive difference and mitigate the impact of climate change. Um, you know, we think about solar solar power, we think about recycling, we think about water use, we think about our transport options. Um, and as consumers and as investors, we have um, also we have financial power um, that can make also a difference on, um, on the environment and on, on the climate. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about how we can use that financial power. And I want to stress that this webinar is, is not financial advice that Coda SA is, uh, is giving, uh, and we are very proud of our independence as a, as a not-for-profit peak body. Um, but this is about um, giving you ideas and helping you understand different approaches that you can take to manage your financial assets or to, to use them um, to impact on climate change in a positive way. So we're talking about how you might bank, how you might shop uh, if you have superannuation or investments, uh, how you might think differently about that to take that ethical uh, filter and the, and the environmental filter um, over those choices that you're making. So I'm now really pleased to hand over to Andrew McNaughton, who's a member of our climate change group, who will introduce our guest, Paul Garner from Novo Wealth. Um, Andrew and Paul will be in conversation for about 20 minutes or so, followed by a Q&A session, and, and they'll be using questions that you have submitted via the questions tab at the bottom of your screen. So please, as you're listening to them, please feel free to submit your questions that way. I hope that you find this webinar really, really interesting and useful. And, um, and please make sure that you connect with us, subscribe to our e-news, follow our social media so that you can uh, be aware of, of more webinars and other news like this. So thanks again for joining us. And Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Miranda. <clears throat> thanks, um, everybody, uh, for, uh, for joining us today. Um, my name's Andrew McNaughton. I'm a member of the CODA SA Climate Change Group. Um, our group is working on a number of webinar topics that we think will be of interest to you and our intention is to present them in a conversational and relaxed way so it's a, it's a bit like having a fireside chat and um, we've got our, our fireside chat uh, expert joining us this evening, this afternoon, morning. Um, so <clears throat> surveys show that uh, climate change certainly rates as one of the top three issues that concern old, older people today. Um, our group has set ourselves the challenge to find actions that we can take locally to make a difference. Uh, one initiative, for example, is that we've been talking to public companies in South Australia uh, about their uh, emission reduction targets and holding them to account um, and um, engaging with their senior executives to, to talk with them about that. The purpose of this webinar is to remind people that they actually have power um, when making decisions where you spend and invest. Uh, and we believe strongly that this can actually help impact climate change. For better or worse, money is a central feature of our society. We all spend money to purchase goods or services. We're directing money towards firms 
that are committed, are we directing money towards firms that are committed to driving emissions is the question that we'd like to ask. Um, if we've got money invested, uh, is it invested in organisations that are committed to emissions reduction? I like the expression, follow the money. Uh, it's usually heard when authorities are investigating corruption or scams. Business is following the money, whether it's seeking to exploit a market or looking for investors to contribute investment capital. For the last 100 years, fossil fuels have played a central role in powering our society. Can we be more selective about where we invest? Can we impact the demand for fossil fuels uh, and therefore reduce our impact on the climate? We think the answer is yes. To help us understand how we use our financial assets or can use our financial assets to impact on climate change, I'd like to introduce Paul as our guest. Paul is the CEO and founder of Novo Wealth, an Adelaide-based financial planning firm which special, specialises in sustainable investments. Shortly, Paul will tell us about his no motivation for setting up Nova Wealth uh, and the approach he's developed for his business. But I'd like to state first that this webinar and the discussion with Paul is for educational purposes, as Miranda has just shared. Um, and is not to be construed as financial advice or a promotion for Novo Wealth. In this webinar, we'll hear from Paul, then we'll take some questions. Welcome, Paul. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your business, and what motivated you to set up Novo Wealth? Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Andrew. And thanks, Miranda. Um, so I uh, career changed into financial planning in 2007, and uh, always had the intention to start my own practice. And as I progressed through uh, learning from the very bottom and uh, learning about uh, oh, the whole business and uh, uh, talking to people about what they want to do with their money, I formulated, uh, I was an activist also at that time in terms of uh, political uh, lobbying for uh, adherence to the uh, climate or no the uh, UN SDGs and and uh, and the government aid budget and then I, I wanted to translate that to something of that was a really important to me and I thought that when I wanted to start my own business I wanted it to have a central plank that was really important to me and not just have a business for the sake of of, of having a business. So when I started in my own practice in 2014, I decided that my specialty will be responsible and ethical investment. And uh, that will be the central plank about uh, how I presented myself to the world. And I thought that as well uh, as an activist, um, money talks, BS walks. Uh, so if I can, use money and encourage enough other people to direct where their money goes, then that's a form of silent activism that can uh, influence things behind the scenes. And so that was my motivation. And my mission was to, uh, we, we, it's got an expletive in it, but I'll drop that. But my mission was to save, save the world. And um, if I could get enough people along that journey, then I thought that was a good way to, to approach things. And um, it's in the last few years, it's become much more mainstream and there's a hell of a lot of options available now to uh, enact that, uh, that activism. Thanks, Paul. And so <clears throat> when you say becoming mainstream, uh, are you suggesting it was not to start with? No, we were very niche uh, when when we first started. So there's a group of us um, advisors uh, called the Ethical Advisors Cooperative uh, who all share this common uh, specialty. And uh, my colleagues are way, way uh, ahead of me in that regard. But um, I, when, when I put my shingle out and, and, uh, and proclaimed it, they, they contacted me and said, uh, well, this we exist and we've been doing this for a long time already 
Uh, and so join us. And so that that was really encouraging. Um, but the 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 choice of being able to um, uh, without very uh, detailed customization, the ability to uh, pick and choose, do it yourself, or, 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 or off the shelf uh, options to choose where your money goes were very limited, and it's become much more uh, a much broader uh, menu now to right. choose. <clears throat> And, and Paul, is, is ethical and socially responsible investing leading to uh, climate change impact? Oh, look, I, I couldn't give you specific figures in that, but it's certainly changing corporate behaviour and made the whole, the whole ESG sustainable, responsible uh, notion very much more mainstream and people are starting to demand it. Right. And uh, and we'd like to think through our advocacy and through our influence, through our clients and through uh, what we do as the Ethical Advisors Cooperative um, is, is helping to change that view. Um, and you see it in, you see, you see it in, um, these aren't good examples, but you, you just look at the uh, advertising that BHP do, for instance. Uh, and how um, the, their total advertising focus is on uh, transition min minerals and 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 supplying the material for for decarbonisation. Uh, you look at Woolworths spinning off their um, uh, pubs, gambling, alcohol arm um, into a completely different company. It's because that there was shareholder pressure; people were excluding them from. Uh, from uh, portfolios because of their association with either alcohol, get more money, money gambling, so pokies and pub ownerships. Um, so that's so two obvious examples. Um, and together with other groups, the pressure we put on banks for funding new fossil fuel projects uh, ha has been significant. Uh, and the whole Adani uh, Yep. process is, is is another example of that uh, so that uh, and, and it's about spreading the word spreading the message that mm. you do have power how how do you exercise that power what what are your thoughts in terms of um, if if someone feels helpless at the moment what could they be doing to make a difference I always start from where you are. Uh, so if if you're in, uh, if you're with a bank, if you're wh whatever financial institution you're with, bank, super fund, investment fund, uh, is is by using your voice to write to them. Uh, a, a, a physical letter is always more powerful than an email. But wh whatever means you have to communicate with them is to encourage or demand answers for things you're not sure of. If you're with one of the big four, it's about what are you doing or not doing about funding new fossil fuel projects. Uh, if you're with a super fund, uh, do you have a, a filtered investment option? And, and what are those filters? And, and what does that mean in terms of actual investments? All that information is available, some not some on websites, some not as uh, uh, transparent as others, but if you ask, um, they should uh, provide the answers. So, and if they're not, then ask why, why not? And if you don't like the answers you get, then walk, uh, change, that is uh, very motivating to the uh, incumbent supplier, uh, if their clients are demanding something and they're not and they're not being delivered, or they're not being delivered something that satisfies, uh, has got holes in it, uh, and that's part of the work we do as the Ethical Advisors Cooperative. We we rate funds or investment options based on a green scale. How green is it, and, and what are the things? Uh, that would concern an average 
ethical investor and, and what are the good points. So we, we publicize that, it's free, and uh, we try to hold the industry to account for uh, cl either claims they're making or uh, the, the, the structure of a fund that they may be offering. We want to encourage more uh, diversity and also uh, filtering of, of investment choices. Mm. But we want to make sure that's true to label. So we hold them account to that and we encourage them to either improve or, or to adapt to what people are demanding. And Paul, um, if if you were to own um, equities or shares, <clears throat> you, you as a shareholder then have a right to exercise your voice at, at the shareholder meeting. Um, and, and so you could therefore join uh, movements or, or apply pressure to organisations. But if you're a member of a super fund, do you have the same kind of uh, ability to exercise your voice, do you think? <clears throat> I, I think so through through the through the fund. Uh, so the fund, depending on how they invest, will either do it themselves or or have investment analysts that advise them on how to, how they structure their portfolios. So member feedback and member uh, member feedback will encourage adoption or improvement in 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 an offering. Uh, so. Most of the industry funds that, that I know of have either a sustainable option or, you know, they're going to call it sustainable, they're going to call it responsible, they're going to call it an ethical, it'll have that sort of uh, description about it. Um, so to me, that says that people, are, their members are demanding it. And um, however, some of them are lighter green right. than others. So uh, that that you know, good on them for doing it, but then the, then they need to be held account to what they're saying is what. And some sometimes that information is really buried deep. So that's where we do the ethical advisors go up is to dig in and, and, and really talk about well, what's why is this company in it? Uh, that those sorts of things. But so the big question, of course, then is what about returns? If I invest in ethical companies, should I expect better or worse returns or around the same? Uh, we, I've got a lot of research saying it's it's going to be as good or if not better. Mm -hmm. However, it's going to be out of cycle. So, for instance, the most uh, in the last year, one of the best performing sectors has been fossil fuels. So uh, the, the war in Ukraine and, you know, the, these events that happen that are, out, that are not expected is going to increase the demand for what's immediately available. So if you didn't have fossil fuels in your portfolio, you would have, you would have underperformed mm. in, in the last year. However, that, that changes and it, and it has been different in the past where uh, not having fossil fuels was uh, really beneficial uh, to our overall performance, but uh, it's gonna be out of sync with a mainstream portfolio, with an unfiltered portfolio as, as world events yeah. change. But, but this, you know, th this is the future. So we understand that there's gotta be a transition um, and, and it depends who you talk to about how that transition, you know, the mainstream political parties talk about gas has to be the mainstream, main um, transition fuel. However, other people say with much more investment and much more focus on, on renewables, then th th that can be overcome. Right. So it's a very confusing and uh, emotional area too and and then I, I now see uh, other uh, people proclaiming well because everyone's rushing over into the sustainable area um, there's a uh, good investment returns to be had from fossil fuel companies or, or from tobacco companies or from uh, uh, armaments um, however that may be the case but still uh, it's it's whether that aligns with if you if you're wanting to invest with your 
aligned with your values, then um, sometimes you need to shut off the, uh, okay, uh, maybe I'm going to uh, be out of sync with the mainstream market, but I'm prepared to accept that. And you will accept the good returns when when the, the cycle changes. Right, right. So, so Paul, um, given that pressure is there now on companies, um, greenwashing is a new word that's sort of entered the vocabulary. Um, are, are you seeing um, resistance or is that um, <clears throat> uh, becoming a feature of the, the messaging to you as a financial advisor um, to try and draw uh, funds into those organisations? What's your observation? Look, it has been, uh, and as people have seen that it is becoming more of an issue than um, a, a, a cheap marketing tactic would be to, to, to slap uh, one of those uh, descriptors on the fund, um, and it, it can be misleading. So that's part of the work we do as the Ethical Advisors Cooperative is to is to hold that to account. And now ASIC, the regulator of the industry, is, is uh, certainly being much more active in that. In fact, they've, um, they've cited uh, a particular fund that had sustainable in the title, but was nowhere near that. And uh, so they're, they're becoming more of a police uh, person on, on that front, which is good because we can put, uh, informal pressure on it but they put formal pressure on, mm. onto that area and that'll become more apparent because uh people either don't have the time or the inclination or the understanding to dig deep into into the information you know you, a product disclosure statement can be hundreds of pages thick and can be well uh it, it could, good good for uh, sleep de deprivation or or insomnia but uh, not a particularly interesting read that, that most people would enjoy. Um, but mm. that's why we're trying to do that, that work up front to deliver something that's easily digestible and understandable by people who, who want to know what's under the bonnet, but yep. don't have the wherewithal to, to do that or the inclination to do that. And, and so having sort of spent some time talking about the landscape, the, now we switch to, so what do we do if if what would your advice be to a person that felt like they wanted to play a more meaningful role? Where, where would they start? Yeah, well, again, start where your funds are invested. Uh, talk to talk to the bank. Um, if you if you're with a financial institution more often than not, they will have a specific person in charge of ESG or their, uh, so ESG standing for environmental societal governance uh, person uh, or uh, their, their um, stable uh, person, all the major companies have them now and uh, question them. Uh, what are you doing? If there's particular concerns that you have, uh, then, then question that. Uh, other financial institutions, super funds, talk talk to them uh, as a first instance. Say, these are my concerns. What are you doing about that? Uh, they'll either answer direct or point you to specific information that is already available. If that doesn't satisfy you, then question that again. Mm. Um, and then, uh, if that if that happen if if the answers you get don't satisfy what you're looking for, then you need to look for something different and you you do that through what uh, internet research, uh, talking to people like me, um, finding other information uh, freely available out there, um, look at funds that uh, specifically uh, invest in that type of things. For instance, Future Super, Australian Ethical Super, um, those sorts of funds that, that would have more information and would be more aligned to to what you're looking for um, and and use that as a comparison if, if you don't either have a, an existing advisor or 
or want to have a more do-it-yourself do approach. Right. But uh, there's people like me exist all, all around the country. There's not many of us, but uh, I, I would say it's growing. Mm -hmm. And as people uh, demand more, then um, perhaps if they are currently working for an advisor with an advisor, then uh, that that will be a signal to the advisor that that they should take this seriously. However, I get a lot of people coming to me saying, my existing advisor didn't take this seriously. And 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 sometimes it's it's, it's, it's incredible the answers that that or, or some of the replies that people get when they question this. Um, well, so, we, we we we've certainly noticed that um, in the financial advice uh, industry, conservatism is um, is very obvious. Very you know, people are very concerned about preserving their capital. And so taking risks is um, is something that's seen to be something you don't want to do. But I guess if if you've got a set of values that don't line up with where you're investing, then the challenge is to uh, ask yourself, am I actually prepared to invest according to my values rather than follow the conservative um, uh, Kool-Aid that's, uh, that's being drunk? So um, have you got any examples, Paul, maybe to put you on the spot of <clears throat> uh, or people that have come uh, looking or feeling unhappy about their current situation and, and how did you guide them through that? <clears throat> well, it's always, uh, it, it always starts with the individual and, and what their values are uh, because everyone's very different. So what will be... Um, so it's a process of understanding what they would like to exclude and uh, and then what they would like to include, uh, what issues they don't really care about or what issues they'd like to understand more. So, for instance, uh, a, a fund may say that we'll, we don't invest in, we don't invest in, say, uh, fossil fuel type of industries, as long as it's not more than five or 10% of their revenue. Now, for someone uh, with very dark green characteristics, they'll say, well, that's not acceptable at all. Um, so we'd have to exclude that fund, that fund or that company from, uh, from their portfolio. So if, if they're very dark green, then sometimes the compromises that may be in existing off the shelf options may may not suit that individual so we'll have to develop a very customized portfolio for, for them of direct assets that we're making choices about um, for other people who are who are lighter green or, or understand that uh, companies are transitioning or they may have a small part of their operation involved in say the transport of of fossil fuels um, whether that's acceptable or whether uh, pharmaceutical companies, for instance, uh, if, if, they, if part of their research and development or, or part of what they do is not aligned to individuals' values, then they want to exclude that, that type of company, building companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some sectors are hard to find uh, a, a, a filter on. Property, for instance, is, is harder to, to have a specific um, filtered fund uh, for property infrastructure is getting better. There's now uh, responsible invested infrastructure funds that, that won't invest in uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, for instance, um, uh, gas utilities, those sorts of transport mechanisms. Uh, and, and so, and, and bonds uh, in terms of money lending, uh, it's very difficult sometimes to track where uh, a financial institution's money ends up uh, and it, 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 those sorts of things are, mm. are becoming more available, but it's a more difficult area in, in terms of the money flow can get quite opaque when it gets to the ends of where it flows. Right, Thank, thanks, Paul. Well, so I, I think perhaps if I just summarize where we've been it starts with your values 
Um, and once you've decided how strongly or um, how convicted you are of uh, your values, then you start to question your current situation um, and see if the organisation that you're in or with um, or your own structure is supporting those values. Um, and I, 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 th then the option is to start looking for alternatives that do support those values. Are, are there tools that you would point anyone to, Paul, to, um, to help, uh, I guess, add some flesh to that, um, to that skeleton of, you know, this is where or how we would approach this? Yes, there are organisations that uh, have that view. Uh, one of the more uh, higher profile ones would be market forces. Uh, so they have a ratings on their website for uh, how how green uh, various companies are or institutions. That's, that's a good place to start. Also, there's the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, uh, RIAA, uh, that uh, produce a list of uh, ethically or funds that have got their certification on it. And also our, our own Ethical Advisors Cooperative, eac.org.au. Uh, if, you, if you put in green uh, leaf ratings into Google search, you'll, you'll get straight to the page where uh, we gradually and, and, and continually rating funds on a, on a green leaf scale. So one to, find, one to five green leaves uh, will indicate how green the fund is and, and have a, a one two page snapshot of what's good, what's bad about the fund and, and mm -hmm. things to be aware of. Uh, so all of those things are freely available and, uh, uh, and uh, exist for people's consumption. And I, I, I've got uh, a lot of information on blog, on my blog about um, uh, various issues to do with ethical investment, uh, fund returns over time, that, that dispelling that myth of, that you have to sacrifice returns for your values, and and we we don't think that is the case. Right, right. Well, I, I guess you've you've helped us, uh, Paul, understand what and how we can um, you know respond to our values. Um, one of the things, as I said before, we may need to overcome is the conservatism or the don't change anything mentality that comes from. The traditional, um, you know, blue chip investments, and uh, that um, that's something you may have to push through, right? Uh, if you want to maintain a relationship with um, with that firm, that well, that's right. And you also also need to look internationally, much more so, because the Australian market, uh, well, the listed Australian market is made up of big four banks and, and miners. Uh, a, a large part of the uh, of the index is is those companies, and if those companies are against what you want to invest in, then uh, you've got to go down to smaller, medium sized companies, which again increases the risk. Um, so, to find mature, cash flow positive, uh, uh, good investment companies that also are trying to do the same thing, uh, create sustainability, increase the, uh, oh, I have a positive impact on, on this whole picture and on the world, then you've got to look internationally because that's where you'll find the more mature companies who uh, are, are doing quite niche things, but because the world is their uh, uh, platform, mm. then mm. they are big companies. And um, mm. it's, it's fascinating to understand what, what companies are doing to uh, improve either uh, things as every day as packaging. Right. Uh, sustainable packaging, uh, reuse, uh, recycling, uh, making existing industries more efficient, um, yeah. providing, the, providing the components to power electric vehicles rather than investing in the uh, end manufacturer. 
but uh, maintenance systems, uh, measuring systems, th there's such a huge world out there of, of companies doing sustainable things or contributing to yep. the the uh, the the uh, this whole concept of uh, decarbonisation and moving towards more efficiency, uh, more reuse. It's it's um it's a very broad world out yep. there, and you've got to look beyond Australia, which uh, for some people is an issue, others not. But right. if you focus just on Australia, then you you do have to take more risk because you you're. You're naturally investing in smaller to medium-sized companies, which may not have the track record, may not have the cash flow yet to um, also be that mix or that art of investment, which is blending um, uh, investment in uh, what what, what, you, what the outcome you want. Right, and and back to investment one hundred and one, not to put all your eggs in one basket. Right? Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Well, look, Paul, thanks. Um, you, you've just, I guess, illustrated what I mentioned earlier, which um, was the expression, follow the money. You know, we, we know that this transition is taking place. Um, it's gathering momentum. Um, the, the world is realising you know, that uh, the equilibrium status that we've been in for many years with um, dependency on fossil fuels is actually coming to an end. Um, and that there are a number of new technologies that are emerging that are actually disrupting um, the, the current state. So um, I, I, for one, am a bit excited about what that disruption might mean. Um, and the, um, the industry would always want to act in a way that preserves its profits and preserves its, uh, its capital. Um, but there are forces acting now that, uh, that are significantly uh, greater than that, which are going to create those disruptions and new technology. So uh, for one, I'm, I'm particularly keen to, uh, to invest where I see that will accelerate that transition. So um, look, let me, um, let me open it up to a couple of questions that we've seen coming in from, um, from our, our viewers. Um, I've, uh, I've got the first question here. Uh, good morning. I have some shares in Argo Investments. Um, about 12 months ago, I asked them about their practices around climate change investing. Um, they replied that they were not actively pursuing a policy in that area. Uh, a disappointing response, but not too surprising. Argo is a strongly performing firm can a guide to climate change investment be talked about, please? What are your thoughts there, Paul? A guide to climate change investing. Um, well, I have, look, there are specific funds out there in, in the direct listed space. Uh, and I'm, I'm more talking about managed funds, so they can be difficult to access uh, directly in terms of they don't have, if, if, if you're investing through a, a share broking platform, uh, then there's, unless there's a, a, a specific vehicle designed to be bought and sold on the stock exchange, then uh, your, your options are limited. On, on as a direct investor. Um, so uh, again, uh, as a guide to climate change investing, I'd, I'd look at the uh, Australian Ethical website, the Future Super website, um, Market Forces, and, and our um, Ethical Advisors Co-op leaf ratings uh, to to get that information or and 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 to get a better sense of what's out there to be able to investing mm. mm. does that answer that well <clears throat> um i'm sure the questioner will uh will come back if uh if that's not detailed enough and just a reminder to uh everybody watching um the questions are, are very private um uh they will be asked um there's they're completely anonymous so um feel free to uh to ask the questions that you want um another question uh, 
Paul, and I think you've answered this, have you utilized the information from market forces? And I think that was one of the tools that you referred to earlier, right, Paul? Yes, uh, I, I did a, a talk last year at the end of Writers Week. They had a climate change in the arts. Um, and uh, 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 we, there was a session on divestment and it was myself and um, one of the people from market forces. And we were talking about that whole issue about divestment. And I still think that talk is available on on the on their website, the uh, um, Australian Fest, uh, Adelaide Festival website. It, it it should be if on YouTube or otherwise linked through their website. So that may be uh, a good information source. Thanks, Paul. Um, Another question. Um, I'm totally opposed to animal experimentation in medical research, but find it hard to find funds that specifically preclude this. Uh, have you any advice on where to find such a fund? Wow, uh, there's a very specific fund called um, Cruelty Free Super. Um, that exists, that its primary, its primary directive is no, Cruelty to animals, right? And it's it's called cruelty free super. And um, if that is your your uh, key issue, then that's the fund for you. If it's it's only a super fund, <laughs> but um, uh, there may be a lot of information on there that uh, will guide your um, will, will will guide your thinking in that area, Robin. Good. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. I hope that um, is helpful. Um, just um, just one more question that's come in. Um, <clears throat> uh, do you think that shareholders are reasonably exercising their power in shareholder meetings with these large firms or are they dealt with as a nuisance and then the company does what they want to anyway? I think that I think so. However, when there's enough, if if enough people get together, then um, different companies have different rules for when they have to consider uh, um, opposition to a, a resolution or or, or a vote. Um, so often, um, there's an organisation. Uh, uh, their acronym is A A Triple C. Um, Australian Corporate um, Centre for Responsible uh, Corporate Responsibility, and and often they put a call out to uh, I I individuals and people like us to say, who of your clients has got shares in Westpac, for instance? We're putting together a resolution, and we need uh, a, 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 a mass. Uh, to be able to get this through. So who, who's got um, people in that fund, in, in that company, and uh, we, we need their voice, their vote uh, for this. So um, ACCC or ACCC are often uh, 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 organise that type of uh, referral to uh, shareholders to do that. And sometimes... Uh, sometimes funds have an investment in a company to be that activist, to have an activist voice. Right. And, you know, even though we, we may question, why have you got uh, a holding in BHP, for instance? Um, but and, and they say, which can be valid, well, we want to influence their process or AGL or Origin or an energy company. They want to influence their process and their acceleration towards uh, renewables. So we need to be an inside voice rather than an outside voice. So that's that's about that's valid as well. <clears throat> so what what I think I'm hearing is that as well as being an individual shareholder or owning equities yourself and exercising that voice in shareholder meetings, um, you can apply pressure to your super uh, fund if if you have one, um, and that super fund can then potentially poll other organisations or. Uh, ask other or seek to gather support from those other organizations to strengthen 
uh, and meet mm -hmm. the uh, the minimum number of shareholders um, to to yeah. trigger those kinds of um, changes of directional votes in the in the annual general meeting. Yep. Interesting. Good. Well, it's helpful to know. Um, well, look. Yes, that I uh, just um, the Australasian Centre for Corporate Responsibility, ACCR.org.au. Thank you. Thank um, you. Um, just um, checking one last question here. Um, the um, yeah, I think we've covered the trade-offs between returns and ethical investments. I'm I'm a retiree trying to protect my nest egg, but want to do so ethically. I think this comes back to your question around values, <clears throat> being clear on what your values are and then acting on those values. Um, well, look, I think we've, we've uh, no more questions coming in. Just uh, for us to summarise, Paul, and, and um, thank you for your time. Uh, we've gained some insight, uh, particularly in relation to tools and things that we can do some research in. Um, and... Uh, I have, um, uh, yeah, I'd like to particularly just close with the steps that you've given us. The values are our starting point. Um, the pointers that you've given to us for the green ratings, market forces and Australian ethical. Um, the comment on international investments, not just Australian investments. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the actual fire in the belly to make those changes, um, it, to, to be an activist rather than, um, you know, just uh, allow uh, to go with the flow, so to speak. Um, so and I just on with that, uh, Andrew, you're always uh, bringing in uh, sensible uh, uh, investment philosophies to make sure that you're your risk profile or your exposure to shares and property versus cash and fixed interest is appropriate for you as yes. well. Very important. So that's that's key too, and particularly yep. that question about managing risk and managing your, uh, protecting your capital, then that balance has to be very um, uh, prevalent as well. Yep. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. I'd also like to thank um, the, the COTA technical team, uh, Kirstine and Jody, for assembling the, uh, the resources uh, to deliver this webinar. Uh, to our participants today, thank you very much for the questions you've asked, um, and to COTA SA for the platform to, uh, to have this discussion. Uh, Paul, on behalf of Miranda, uh, our acting CEO, I'd like to thank you for uh, joining the uh, the webinar uh, and sharing the information that you have today. I'm sure uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch um, and may schedule some future conversations in the in the activities that we've got coming up. So delighted. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll wrap up the webinar and it'll be available as uh, as the recording on the Coda website um, uh, for future use. So thank you, everybody. Let's close the webinar now. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Paul. Pleasure. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye.